We closed the previous episode by seeing that if a particle with a given mass decays into a pair of photons, we can reconstruct this mass if we measure the properties of the photons. Now, this is actually true for decays into any particles that we can precisely measure. For example, if the Higgs boson decays into two Z bosons, one Z boson decays into two muons, the other into two electrons, you'll have two muons and two electrons in the final state, and it'll again be possible to reconstruct the mass of the Higgs from the energies and the momenta of these four particles. But let's stay with our example of photon pairs, and let's ask the following question. What if the two photons are not coming from the decay of the Higgs boson? In fact, what if they're not coming from the decay of anything at all? They're just two completely unrelated photons produced somewhere during the particle collision. When we detect them, we cannot see their past, so we won't know that. So what will be the meaning of the mass that we calculate? Well, for such two unrelated photons, it's going to essentially be a random number with no clear physical meaning. So our situation is basically this. We see two photons, we calculate the invariant mass of the system, and now there are essentially two possibilities. Either the photons are coming from the decay of some particle, for example, the Higgs boson, and then the mass that we've calculated is the mass of that particle. Or they're not coming from any decay, and the mass is a random number. Now, if we only ever see one pair of photons, it's impossible to tell the difference between these two cases. But if we do the experiment many times, then the difference between the random number and the fixed number is going to eventually show up. Now let's illustrate this with a short story. For this, we need to travel to the heart of the Swiss Alps, where deep inside the lush alpine forest, you can find the home of a remarkable creature. Let's take a look. What looks like an ordinary hole under a tree is actually the entrance to a network of tunnels inhabited by a rabbit. Not an ordinary rabbit, but a white rabbit that once lived in a casino but had to move out when the casino was torn down to build a supermarket. Okay, at this point you're probably wondering what has just happened. You were watching a video about particle physics and suddenly this? Magical gambling, rabbits in the forest? Well, I'm here to reassure you, this is still the video about particle physics. The story is just an analogy illustrating an important point. So stay with me. Now the story is that Back in the casino, the rabbit would love watching people play dice. And what made him especially happy was when the result on the dice was four. And to this day, whenever he comes across a die, he always turns it such that the number four is facing upwards. Now, the rabbit is said to be very, very shy, to the point where nobody has ever seen it. And the only way to know if it's there is by throwing dice into the hole, coming back in a few hours or the next day and checking what the result is. If the rabbit was passing by, it'll surely be his favorite number. Let's give it a try. Okay, let's see what we got. Ah. Yeah, it's a four. But actually, maybe I just rolled the four by accident. So let's try it again. Ah, oh, it's a three. So maybe this time he just didn't come. Let's try again. It's a two. Two. Uh, there's a four. One. One. Five. Three. Six. Two. Two. Okay, so what are we learning here exactly? We have a sequence of numbers. Some of them are four, but not all of them. So if anything, the rabbit doesn't always come out and interfere. So to better understand what's happening, let's make a histogram. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I'll draw a plot and I'll mark the results. So the first number we got was four. Four. Then we got three. Uh, then we got two. Then we got another two. Uh, Okay, this is gonna be easier on the computer. We got four, three, two, two, four, one, one, five, three, six, two, two, four, five, three, four, six, three, two, three, two, three, two, three. That's what we got. Five, six, four, one, six, three. This is the result that we got after 30 tries. So a month if we did this once per day. Okay, so the number four didn't come up that many times. Actually, we got the number three more often. So, 
Okay, what happens if we run this, this experiment longer? For a year. We do 300 tries. Okay, this is getting weird. So, what is happening here? Well, okay, what do you think is happening? Go ahead, hit pause and think about it for a second. Okay, we're back. Uh, I won't tell you the answer, but instead, I'll run the experiment for 10 years. So now we have rolled the dice 3,000 times. What are we seeing? Well, we can draw two conclusions. One, the story about the rabbit is most likely true. And two, looks like his favorite number is not four, like we thought, but three. The plot shows us how many times we got each possible result after 3,000 dice rolls. And if the rabbit didn't exist at all, you'd expect all numbers to be just as likely to show up. But we have a clear access at three. So looks like not all results were random. Some have been altered, replaced with a number three. So we have in a way observed the rabbit without ever seeing it directly. We have learned what its favorite number is, three. Uh, and you can also deduce the fact that the rabbit shows up on average once in 10 dice rolls. Okay, so now back to the Higgs. With the Higgs, it's a similar situation, but instead of throwing dice, we're colliding particles and looking at what's produced in the collision. Specifically, we're looking at invariant masses of photon pairs. If we didn't produce a Higgs in the collision, that invariant mass is going to be a random number, just like the result of the dice roll was a random number when the rabbit didn't come. But if we do produce a Higgs and that Higgs decays into a pair of photons, the invariant mass of that photon pair is going to be the mass of the Higgs just like the favorite number of the rabbit. Now with the rabbit, we ended up learning that his favorite number was different than what we expected. With the Higgs, we didn't have an expectation because we didn't know its mass before we found it. We just had a broad range, so we had to look if a peak would appear somewhere in that range. To see how this works, let's make another plot. Previously, for every dice roll, we were plotting the result on the dice. Now, for collisions in which we find two photons, we're gonna be plotting their invariant masses and we'll animate this plot to see how it was filling up as we were taking data throughout the years 2011 and 2012. All right, let's pause for a second. One thing that you can already see is that the plot is not flat. Why is that? Well, for dice rolls, the probabilities of all outcomes were equal, so the result was flat. Here, that's not the case. The probabilities are different. It's easier to produce photons with low energy and it's harder to produce photons with higher energy. So these are still random numbers, but some are more likely than others. We call that a non-flat probability distribution. All right, let's continue with the animation. And there you have it. At around 125, you see a peak, telling us that there's a particle there with that mass decaying into pairs of photons. Remember the rabbit again. If there was no rabbit, all of the dice rolls would have been just normal, random dice rolls, and the result would have been a flat plot. But the plot had a peak, created by the rabbit inserting the number 3 into the results. Now, if there was no Higgs boson, this plot would have been just a smooth falling curve of random masses. But clearly they're not all random, something inserted the number 125 into the results, a particle with that mass, decaying into two photons which is what we were expecting for the Higgs boson. Okay, I want to stress one more point. And for that, let's go back to what the plots look like early on, both the photons and the dice. You see that it's not obvious where the peak is or whether there's actually any peak at all. In the beginning, the plots are so random, you can barely tell what's going on. Only with enough data, the picture smooths out, the randomness, the statistical fluctuations become smaller, and the effect starts coming through. So you might wonder, at which point can we actually be sure that our peak is not just another statistical fluctuation? Well, we can never be 100% sure, but for a given peak, we can calculate the probability. And the commonly accepted threshold for discovery is the point at which the probability that there's nothing there and that the peak we're seeing is just the result of pure chance, the probability of that is about one in three and a half million. Still not 100%, but pretty close. So for the Higgs boson discovery in 2012, this level was not reached by a single peak, but by a combination of peaks 
found by looking at different Higgs boson decays. So in addition to the two photon decay, this was the decay into two Z bosons, giving four leptons in the final state, and the decay into two W bosons, giving two leptons and two neutrinos. Okay, we made it to the end. And I hope that you'll agree with me that conceptually, finding new particles is not that complicated. Let's summarize the steps. First, we have to produce the particle. So we accumulate energy in particles in a particle accelerator, collide them, and then this energy can transform into the mass of this new particle. That particle will then immediately decay into other particles, and we can measure them in our particle detectors and calculate the invariant mass. If we do this many times, we can make a plot of these invariant masses, and the particle we're looking for will show up as a peak in that plot, just like the Higgs boson did. Now, this was, of course, a bird's eye view of the analysis. In reality, this analysis was much more detailed and complex. But the general principle is what we just said. This is really how we do it. Just remember that to actually find the Higgs boson, it took us two years of accumulating and analyzing the data from the Large Hadron Collider, two experiments, ATLAS and CMS, with several thousand of people involved in each one of them. And that's not counting the many, many more years and, and people involved in the design, construction, and operation of the Large Hadron Collider and the experiments. On the other hand, this story was about finding the Higgs boson decaying into two photons. But the Higgs boson was really just used as, a, as an example here. The story was really about seeing and detecting or discovering particles. Many other particles have been discovered using a similar approach in the past, and we hope to find more in the future. So I hope it was clear, and thanks for watching. If you have questions or things you'd like us to cover in future videos, please type them in the comments below, and uh, I'll see you soon.